Hey everyone, this is Ben, and you're watching Uncharted X. When you're walking around and looking at ancient sites, trying to find the specific signs of ancient high technology can be quite a difficult endeavor. These clues, these indicators that something very advanced indeed seems to have been happening at some point deep in antiquity. For example, the evidence of ancient machining or the clinical precision that is so often seen in ancient boxes and statues and megalithic architecture. These clues can quite often be very hard to find. Much of the time they're in or they're under or they're layered in amongst construction work that's of a much more primitive nature. However, there is one place that these indicators of ancient advanced technology are really not very hard to find at all, where they seem to pop out at you from almost anywhere you look. And this is a place that hardly anybody gets to visit. It's been closed to the general public for more than 100 years. It's the Old Kingdom site of Abu Sia in Egypt. On this ancient pyramid site, there are machined surfaces almost everywhere you look. There are giant megalithic blocks of granite and of basalt and of limestone. There are the remnants of huge symmetrical single piece granite columns. There are obelisks here. There are many highly advanced tube drill marks at Abu Sia just astonishing marks that have been cut into granite and other extremely hard stones. There is the evidence and markings for gigantic and what seems to be very thin circular saws that have been used to cut these massive blocks of basalt. There are also strange precision carved slabs. And the site even has a confusing and very complex subfloor conduit and plumbing system. And interestingly, Abu Sia also has a pair of giant single piece precision carved granite boxes that are housed in an underground chamber. And these boxes have some very unique features relative to all the other boxes you can see in Egypt. Before I get into the details of Abu Sia, I want to spend just a minute to frame the discussion with some context. It's something I try to do in all of my content. I've talked about these topics in much more detail in other videos, there are some links below. And if you've heard this before and you just want to go straight to the site investigation, skip ahead to around 6 minutes in. These examples of ancient advanced technology at Abu Sia, they simply don't match the known capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians. And they certainly don't match the tools that we found in the archaeological record. Yet at the same time, it's also clear that the dynastic Egyptians occupied and they built on this site. Their work, their somewhat more primitive style of construction, and their inscriptions into the stone are everywhere. So what does this mean? Why are there clearly multiple levels of technology? And it's not only this site, or simply sites that are in Egypt. We find the evidence for multiple levels of technology at many of the megalithic remains that exist in so many other places all around the world. We have advanced and sophisticated megalithic walls that are holding up much more primitive construction work, much like here at Alante Tambo in Peru. Or these amazing megalithic walls that are holding up a bunch of mortar and mud brick constructions at the temple of Wiracocha. We have primitive writing that's been etched into some very sophisticated objects, like these giant polished boxes in the Serapium. I've talked a lot about those. Or you could simply compare the quality of the writings on this statue to the quality of the statue itself. A list of examples of multiple levels of technology on ancient sites or on ancient objects could go on and on. I look at many of them in the videos on this channel. A constant and perplexing aspect of this fact is that what you see is that the most advanced technology, the most precise work, the largest work, all of this seems to be always on the oldest sites. It seems to be in the deepest layers of construction that is found on these places. This is a real contradiction to the known story of history, yet this undeniable evidence seems to hint at a much more complex story. It really hints at much longer timelines when it comes to human civilization. It hints at the concepts of inheritance and of renovation, and it seems to suggest that multiple civilizations may well have occupied and worked on these places during the millennia of the past. Over the last 20 years, this hypothesis for a technologically advanced ancient precursor civilization, one that was far more ancient and far more advanced than those we currently accept in mainstream history, this theory has only become stronger and much more plausible with the correlation of a lot of new scientific evidence that's come up in fields outside of archaeology. New DNA findings have shown us that much more complex human interactions existed in the past. 
we've got the radical extension of the human timeline going back now hundreds of thousands of years longer than previously thought as well as the now overwhelming evidence for massive cataclysms at the end of the last ice age most notably the younger driest cosmic impact all of these new scientific discoveries and new scientific work is lending strength to this hypothesis this idea of a lost ancient civilization is also supported by what almost all ancient cultures say about their own history. Origin stories almost universally involve cataclysm, and they talk of older times, more ancient times, where more advanced or more capable beings walk to the planet. And then of course we have the contradictions that come to us from the clearly advanced technology that's being used in the construction of various ancient objects and architecture. In this video, I want to explore just one of the many astonishing aspects of high technology that exists here. We're going to take a look at the pair of remarkable and quite unique precision boxes. These boxes are housed in the underground section of what is known as the Mastaba of Patashepsis. And look, I'm sure I'm murdering that name, so go easy. So in any case, please give the video a thumbs up and do leave a comment. It really helps me out with the YouTube algorithms. And if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to get notified when new content comes out. I definitely plan to take a closer look at the other aspects of this site in future videos. Abu Sir is located sitting amongst all of the other pyramid sites of what's known as the Sun Belt, the line of various pyramid sites that stretch more or less north to south along the Nile in Egypt. You can see here looking north from Abu Sir, which has multiple pyramids, you can see the pyramids of Giza. South from Abu Sia, you can actually see the Step Pyramid of Djoza, and further south from that, you have the area of Dashur, which has the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. Getting there isn't too bad. You kind of have to battle the Cairo traffic for a little while, which can always be an experience. It can take an hour or two to get out there. It is true that the site's been closed to the general public for more than 100 years, but it is possible to visit. It takes a special permission and a fairly hefty fee. It's actually pretty awesome because lots and lots of groups tend to be going to this site now. So more and more people do get to see it, but you can't just turn up there and expect to buy a ticket as you might when you go up to Giza. It does take a little bit of fandangling to be granted access to Abu Sir. It's quite a lovely neighborhood that sits right next to Abu Sir. There are small estates out here, a lot of greenery and gardens. There are stables and those types of things. This neighborhood is right next to the pyramids themselves. I've actually seen plenty of people riding horses in the dunes, driving buggies, and the local children actually use these sites as a playground, which I think is pretty cool. I've visited this place and its sister site, Abu Jarab, which is right next to it, at sunset on a couple of occasions, and it's quite a surreal experience. Every time I've been there, the site has pretty much been empty, but it's been the domain of a lot of new research from the Czech Institute of Archaeology in recent years. There are several papers from that institute that you can find of recent excavations and some work that's been done over the past couple of decades. The area we're focusing on today is the Mistaba of Ptashepsis, and this is located kind of to the left of the first pyramid, the entryway, the way that most people gain access to the site. Behind the Mistaba, there are a couple more pyramids and more courtyards. I think the whole place was more or less a pyramid complex, and it's all connected. As you can see, this Mastaba was once an underground construction, and it would have had a roof and probably other Mastabas built right on top of it. Right now, it's all open to the sky, and it does tend to fill up with sand, so everything you see here has kind of been exposed to the elements for, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of years. Even Orthodox archaeology will tell you that there was at least three phases to the construction of this site. I think it's quite likely that the original underground megalithic structure is actually far older than that and then the site was worked on by the early dynastic Egyptians, in this case the 5th dynasty. It was most certainly used as a tomb for Ptashepsis. He was the vizier for the 5th dynasty pharaoh Nusara and he was also his son-in-law as he married Nusara's daughter and this was a sign that maybe Ptashepsis was also quite likely of the royal bloodline himself. We know this because of the inscriptions that are left to us on the site. And if you've seen my videos before, you'll know that I think a lot of these inscriptions and the hieroglyphs were actually added in much later periods. Periods certainly well after the construction of the original megalithic cores to these sites. An interesting side note on this is the pointy skirt, if you notice in this drawing of Ptashepsis. And this tends to be an indicator of importance or of relevance. When you see glyphs with pointy skirts on them, the bigger or the pointier or the more dramatic the actual skirt is, it relates directly to how important that person was. In this case, Ptashepsis was the vizier or the grand vizier, and that's essentially the hand of the king, if you like your references Game of Thrones style. As you can see walking through here, there are several chambers. There's also a room with a number of pillars. 
Looking down, you can see that the boxes themselves were housed in what must have been an underground chamber. Accessing this chamber is a little bit of an adventure. There is a very short but a very familiar descending passageway, one that matches almost exactly, just feels that way to me, exactly the dimensions of many other pyramid structures. It's a three foot by three foot tunnel that descends down, and in this case there's no stairs, there's no wooden rails. You have to kind of shuffle down there. You can see Luke demonstrating it here. It's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Throw a bit of sand down and kind of slide down on your heels. As you can see, there are two precision carved granite boxes with lids in this chamber. The fact that there are two of them is slightly interesting. If this was indeed a tomb for Ptah Shepsis, then how come he needs two boxes? How many sarcophagus does a dead guy need after all? One box is smaller than the other and it has a quite heavily damaged lid, but this box is incredibly interesting to me because it has what appears to be a limestone in a layer. There's actually a box in a box. This limestone in a layer is a single piece box in and of itself, and it perfectly fits in the dimensions of the granite outer box. It's really astonishing, and you can see where it's been damaged and this piece of the limestone has broken away. You can see the granite face, and you can just tell how tight and precise that fit was. It's, uh, it's quite perplexing. This damage has happened relatively recently to this box. I have found some black and white photos of this site that actually show the lining to be more intact than what it currently is. But, I mean, it's open to the elements. Anything can happen. The larger box is also very interesting. It reminds me a lot of the Serapium boxes. Both of these objects are made from rose granite, likely granite that's been shipped up from Aswan, which is 500 miles away. And as you can tell, being open to the elements, sand blows in, the occasional rainstorm, these boxes would get wet. They're exposed to the weather. When you take the time to clear away some of this sand, some of this dust and debris, the finish on the granite is just astonishing. The polish is still very evident and the surface just feels really smooth to the touch. Even the limestone seems to be finished to a relatively high degree. We uh, got pretty good at making a little bit of mud here. You can clearly see what this box may have looked like in all of its glory and you can see the contrast with the limestone in a box. I haven't seen any other examples of these types of things that have those inner boxes. It's a really interesting and unique aspect to me. And the larger box itself also looks to be very well made. Just very flat surfaces, very precise cuts. Unfortunately, you can't really get at it. It doesn't appear to have anything in it. The lid has been propped up. These boxes aren't quite the same size or scale as those in the Serapium. It does seem possible that they've been moved around. It's also evident that there is multiple levels of technology being used in the masonry here. There are several different styles of construction. There is clearly quite a lot of megalithic work here. You can see the bottom layers and a just gigantic block that sits above the entrance to this chamber. You can see cruder forms of masonry, likely done by the dynastic Egyptians in their renovations on this site. And then some more of the work is pretty obviously modern, or might have been done in the Greek Roman time. And of course, none of this work matches the precision or the sheer scale of the megalithic work, which is at the lowest layers, which means it's the oldest. A good example is the precision shown in the masonry of the small tunnel that you have to then crawl back out of on your hands and knees. This is a very interesting section of Abu Sia, and I find it to be very similar to Mastaba 17 at my doom, which we find sitting next to the so-called pyramid. The layout of the box chamber in Abu Sir is almost identical to what we find under the Mastaba here at My Doom. We just don't have the mud brickwork that sits on top of the megalithic construction. You can see that this work that sits on top of the ground is actually quite primitive. Yet take a look at the megalithic chamber that's actually built underneath it and you have to go through a series of tunnels to get in there. This megalithic chamber at My Doom, it also has a precision carved granite box that must have been put down in this chamber before the rest of the site was built. So here we have yet again another great example of some very primitive construction that sits on top of very sophisticated and precise megalithic work. It really begs the question, why was it done this way if it was supposed to be a single civilization that built it and in a single time period? Logic tells us that the bottom layer, the more advanced masonry work, had to have happened first. So how is it that the technology level regressed so much when it came time to build the structure on top? To me, this is a clear indication of inheritance and reuse. 
The later culture, the dynastic Egyptians, they obviously respected and revered this more ancient work, but they weren't able to match the high technology nature of the megalithic construction. We see the same sort of thing all over the world and I really don't understand why more of our mainstream academics don't actually address this point and investigate it. It seems to me that the technological angle of this work is seriously worthy of some further scientific study. Well, I hope you enjoyed that brief look at a part of Abu Sir. There's just so much to talk about on this. Well, hello everyone. Welcome. Good to see everybody in the chat. Uh, I figured we'd get started just a little early. I would have run the stream starting soon. Countdown and some music, but looks like there's like a ton of people in the chat already, so we might as well get rolling. It's uh, great to see everyone. Um, I was just reading the chat while I was rolling this video and uh, yeah, you guys are coming in from all around the world. It's um, it's really cool to see and thanks for some of the questions and a couple of the super chats already. Um, I really appreciate it. That's great. So what I thought we'd do is is I thought maybe after I'd published a video on a particular topic, uh, often it you know generates questions with people that see it if they hadn't seen the site before. So I thought it might be a nice idea to, to just live stream a little bit. Uh, after I get a video up and we can look at all of the footage and I can try and answer questions I'll do my best to keep up with chat. Uh, I've got the chat embedded here in the stream so you can see it uh, if you're replaying this at some point and uh, Yeah, thanks everyone that's joining. I will try and keep up with the chat So, you know hit me up with questions as we as we go through this but I'll also uh, I've also got a bunch of pictures from this site I've got a few other things a few other ideas. I've actually asked some of my patrons for questions Ahead of time, we'll get to a couple of those. Maybe we can look at a couple of news articles, uh, maybe even some um, some book topics. And I actually have a couple of interesting YouTube channels that I want to show people because I think there's a couple of things out there that I don't think that many of you are aware of that would be a really fun if you're into these topics with some really interesting people. But uh, we will get to that. Uh, let me just scroll back up real quick here and grab a couple. We have Joel, Ben, you legend, you for five dollars New Zealand. Thank you, Joel, and also Beefstrom. <laughs> um, I got a couple of interesting questions that I'll hit just before we get started. And by the way, if the music is too loud or anything, please do give me some feedback. Uh, I, I'm always trying to balance levels. Just let me know what's going on. A um, couple of questions about, uh, one was how did I enjoy my Grand Canyon trips? Some of you may know that I, I had previously last week, this about this time last week, spent um, three days grand, uh, backpacking in the Grand Canyon. Just spectacular, although it was really hot and it's, it's quite a, a, a haul out. Uh, it's something I've thought about maybe doing a little video on, so potentially doing those types of things on my channel. I don't know how much interest there is. I have climbed Kilimanjaro and there's, I've got a lot of real interesting uh, footage. I could tell some interesting stories with us, some of those things. But if people are interested, let me know and I, I can do that. I, the place is spectacular, but I mean 125 degrees in the canyon, so warm. Uh, and the other question was, have I seen Bob Lazar on the Joe Rogan Experience? I actually watched the documentary I haven't watched the podcast yet. I haven't had time. I've been really scrambling all week uh, since I took a few days off. It's the first chance I had this year. But I I'm interested in Bob Lazar's story. He seems like a pretty genuine guy. It's really hard to imagine that he's doing this for any other reason, uh, for any reason around fame. He really doesn't seem to enjoy the attention. And he's absolutely seems to be one of the more scientific, technical-minded people. So his story is very interesting. And the idea that I heard someone say that it's, it comes from a... He said something about the UFOs coming from an archaeological dig. I mean, sure. I, you know, it's, it's, that's the Fermi's paradox thing, you know? It's, it's, you not only have all of the distance of space to contend with when it comes to searching for signs of other intelligent life, you also have time. You know, it's 11 billion years as far as we know it, and, and civilizations rise and fall within thousands of years. Even if you're talking about millions of years, that's still, you, that's, that's an awful lot of one slice of a million years across 11 billion that you have to cross over for two civilizations to be a height at such they might even recognize each other. It's like an ant colony noticing what's going on on the space station. I mean, yeah, would be hard to see. All right, so I'm gonna get this rolling in the background while we're here. Um, and I will, again, try and keep up with everything um, happening in chat. And I do notice all of you coming from the Ancient Architects channel. Thank you very much. I was really appreciative of Matt to give me that shout out. Uh, it was it was huge. I've actually since gotten to know Matt pretty well. We've been talking quite a bit. Uh, maybe we'll collaborate on something in the future or not, but he's a really good guy. I love his method, his research. He's put me onto a few interesting books that I've gone and pursued. Um, so, 
Scotty Ducati. Nice. What's the oldest dates you would give for Abu Sia? There are some I think a lot older than dynastic Egyptians. I think potentially anywhere, wherever you're dating that earliest part. I think I think parts of Abu Sia pre pre um, cataclysmic, you know, pre diluvian. I think a lot of them may date may well date back to that. 15, 20,000, and then whatever period before that that this civilization starts. It's very hard to tell unless we get real good at the cosmic ray testing. Um, before I start this, it just looks like me bush bashing, right, through, through, some, through some sticks. I did actually want to show you something just on the map of, of a little bit about Abu Sia. So where we are, where we start is actually over here. And where we're digging around in is this actually, this, this little patch of bush here. I think there's clearly groundwater that's here. And it's actually at the end of what is the causeway that's attached to this one, the, the pyramid. It's um, it's not Nusarar, it's uh, what is the, let me bring this up real quick. Um, and where is, uh, here we go, Abu Sia. I just want to show the layout. So it's this Saurai, the Sura, whatever, the, however you pronounce it. That's that pyramid. The mastaba that we look at in the the video is is directly next to it. But in part of this, all this footage of we go all through here and all through around over this section as well. And uh, I don't have Abu Ghraib in this in this video. We can do that in another live stream because I've already got like an hour of stuff just on just on raw footage of Abu Sia. There's really lots of lots of real interesting stuff to see um, everywhere in Abu Sia. As I said in the video, this stuff just pops out of you pops out at you everywhere in terms of machine surfaces and interesting things. But what I find to be pretty interesting is, is actually we're, we're looking around at the end here. This, this clearly was a, a pyramid complex that, that extended further down. Uh, as you'll see, there's also an elevation change to the, um, to the causeway. So whether this was a harbor, I'm sure it was connected to water at some point. Um, I know Chuck over at the CF Apps channel talks a lot about that. I'll try to make this video a little bigger. Here we go. But this is, we're looking for blocks in here. And there's actually, you'll see it where we stand on it. There are blocks that are in here, but um, <laughs> I, I had just having, I was having visions of Egyptian snakes and all sorts of stuff. And we had, we had, um, we had so much time to explore. You will hear Luke making fun of my accent you, constantly. You sure we're going the right way here? Where are we going here? <laughs> actually, he, he does, he does crack up about no snakes can handle. But yes, yeah, so there's uh, <laughs> it's all overgrown and clearly some source of water in here um, as we come out. So this is right looking out back towards the uh, towards the pyramids and at the end of the causeway. So and you can see the elevation change in the land. So and you can see the stonework right here. So we're actually standing on part of this megalithic construction that's way down. Can you turn down the music tab? Yes, I will. I turned it off because I think we can probably live without it for most of this. Um, yeah. Let's try that. Yeah. Okay. Ancient spinning cobras. Yeah. I was having visions of it, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> there are some big blocks in here, and if you go looking for photographs, there, there are people that have been in here maybe when it wasn't quite so overgrown. And yeah, I mean, this is just, it's odd to see this sort of thing happening in the desert in Egypt, but this is just between where the houses are and where the pyramids are. How's the research going regarding resonance? I'm, we're still working on it. There's a lot to do there. Uh, I am, that, that video is coming together. There will be, I, I want to give that the, it's, it's, it's the time it deserves, if you like, and particularly in this area here. <laughs> it's like, this, this looks sketchy. Uh, yeah, just imagine stepping on something. How about this? Are they doing anything to keep people from sleeping in and digging in around at Abu Sia? Please, seems pretty open and unrestricted from the video. That's how it is. They don't have fences over stuff. They 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 they, they tightly they control Giza in general, but the other sites you can they do have caretakers. There's always people that live. They basically live on the site, and they get paid a stipend or whatever to uh, keep you know people like us out. Uh, now this is this is and and actually before I look at this I, I do want to just mention that that that's you go to these sites they're open I think they just they don't mind local people accessing it and you you'll often see local people wandering around and as I said in the video the kids actually use it as a playground it's it, it's, it's kind of cool uh, Yusuf grew up 
at Giza and at these places. But other than Giza and the and the tombs where there's artwork, they you know it's pretty open access. In fact, even at the back end of Giza, you can drive, go all the way around all of the the front fences that that are next to civilization and just come in the back way. There's nothing really stopping you. Um, there are army bases out there. A lot of these sites you'll see like right next to the pyramids is a big army base. You're not supposed to film. They say if you if they really catch you filming and they'll come out and, and have a word um there are tons of places out there not explored and that's right adam there's just tons i think there's so much of this is still under the sand and it, it continually gets buried so one thing i just um want to call out here because we'll come back to this uh see this is my little video here yeah some of the you'll see it flips back between luke's perspective and mine on the site, I, I only took a little bit of footage here. I was trying to manage my battery usage because we went to a bunch of sites that day. Um, but you'll see here the blocks in the ground. See, there's like a channeled block. There's actually, the sand's in it now, but it has this channel. And there's a lot of these blocks that have this U-shaped channel in them. And it's actually, it was originally underneath the floor level. So you had these blocks of the floor that were above that. It's almost like a conduit system. And, and it's way down here at the end of the causeway you'll see it everywhere. This is something you see on lots of sites. It's all over Saqqara. It's, and it's whether there was piping that was actually put into that conduit system. But it all runs underneath the floors. So you've got these huge blocks of stone and basalt that are on top of that. And there are places where it comes out. There's some really interesting possibilities when you look at the site from a functional perspective then. I mean, they typically call it a sewer system. And we'll get specifically into why it's probably not a sewer system in this video. A little later on but you, you can see that everywhere you see these channel blocks and not quite often they're made of like white calicide or alabaster um, sort of an interesting material to be making that stuff out of there's blocks of that at, at Saqqara let me catch up on some comments here how far off are we from knowing the truth of these sites will we ever know the truth I, I'd be surprised if we really get it nailed down within my lifetime I, I think there's always going to be some mystery because there's always going to be an interpretation of what was going on here um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a. I was trying to frame this discussion the other day. It, to me, it's. It, I always talk about perspective and this fundamental understanding that enables knowledge. And and think of think of like a cell phone, but go back and show it to a, 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 a someone from the Stone Age. Like you and I, we we know what a cell phone is, but we don't know exactly how it works. We don't know the technical details, but we have some fundamental understandings of concepts that enable us to recognize it and tell you what it is. And that fundamental understanding is of things like, you know, electricity, wireless signals, videos, uh, you know, video cameras. We this this grip on like these little bits of technology that, in your head conceptually, you don't know exactly how they're done or how they work, but you can put them together and understand how a cell phone works. You take all of those fundamental pieces away and show 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 that phone to somebody from a thousand years ago. You just don't have you don't know what you're looking at. It, it looks like a shiny piece of plastic. It looks useless. Like throw it away, it can't do anything, there's no battery, you know. I think there's a there's an element of that that goes on when we look at this site. It, to us, it looks like this ancient primitive work that has these bizarre aspects that are highly precise and and, and just baffling in how, you know, in, in, in those aspects of it. But we're, I think we lack some fundamental concepts to truly put this these these sites in in the right light. You know, we, we can't frame it right. That's that frame of reference. and. Without those fundamental little bits of understanding, it, it would, it's going to be difficult for us to interpret these correctly. And for sure, the dynastic Egyptians used them ceremonially. I, I, I believe I don't I don't believe that we we've completely misjudged the dynastic Egyptians. I think we know a lot about them. We know how they lived. I just don't think that they built everything on here. I think they inherited what was probably something that was much of a much more high technology nature. At least that's what explains it to me. I can't say that's what it is. There's no proof. I mean, there's lacking proof. But it's an interpretation of the evidence, much as this story, the regular story, is an interpretation of it of the evidence. It's just the nature of history. We're not going to know everything. Google Earth, 2017. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of places that. Um, when did I go here? So I've, this, I've got footage in this from two different visits. This was uh, I, my first visit here was 20. 14 or 15 and then I think most of this is from 2016 and most of the stabilized footage is from one visit and then we have oh, there's little bits and pieces that I'll cut in and we'll, we'll stop and take some look at some pictures of some individual um, bits and pieces <laughs> that's, that's Luke, like, doing an Australian accent 
Um, hey, mate, I, I'm pretty sure I don't talk quite like this. I can. I, it's some guy, some comedian in my comment channels, like Australia, like just using a Y in all the words, like English. He talks like that. I talk like how I talk. That's how it goes. Advanced living. A dollar. Thank you very much. Cheers. High tech machinery and waste created in all this work. I do not know. Um, what is my own view as to what happened to all the high tech machinery in the West? So I think machinery disappears. I mean, it's, if it's metal or something, it wouldn't be here. I think what's left is the stone. I, and who leaves the tools at the job site uh, after all? I, I, and again, we don't really, I don't think we have a, a full grip on what these tools are. Now, these things. These things are very interesting. They're everywhere on Abu Sir. There's many, many tubular drill marks, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about tubular drill marks. I've kind of briefly run over the top of them in, in a bunch of my videos, but there's lots to uh, there is lots to see when it comes to tubular drill marks. And let's take a look at a couple of these. Just stop and take some pick. Uh, how do I? Let me just make sure that. Yeah, maybe I'll do this so we can see these pictures without the chat window getting in the way. I am just reading some channels. So this is the, again, coming up the causeway. These images are from a couple of years before this footage was taken. You can see the pyramid and the causeway start. This is, this is like just one part of the causeway. The causeway is likely covered uh, back in the day. And there's, there's obviously that, that layer of conduit that's underneath the floor level and it extended further than this down into the, um, the area. And again, always with these sites, keep in mind that they have been quarried extensively for thousands of years. You, you're barely seeing... I mean, I'm, I've got to imagine it can't be much more than about a quarter of the actual stonework that was here originally. Most of it's been shipped off and it's been used to build the mosques and half the other big buildings in, the, in Cairo and everywhere else. I mean, it's just this is the best stone. The granite comes from a long way away, you might as well take it and use it. And, and you'll see lots of that. There's lots of quarrying marks to show. Brian's in here, is he? I see. Hello, Brian. I, uh... Cool. So you can see the step pyramid over the, the hill as you're approaching. Um, the scaffolding is still on that step pyramid as far as I know. This was the group I was with the first time I visited the site. And again, looking up the causeway, uh, there's some columns and really pretty astonishing work as you get into the courtyard that sits right in front of this uh, first pyramid. Again, lots of different blocks of stone. We'll get into some of those examples, but basalt, limestone, granite, granodiorite. There's black granite. I guess it's granodiorite. A lot of that here. And all of that comes from a long way away. Um, the basalt's not from this area. The granite certainly isn't. You either have Aswan or the Eastern Desert. There's quarries for those, both of them 500 miles away. Um, limestone is, and again, here's, the, here's that conduit block that's it just looks like a, a, a sort of a hard form of limestone to me Rui Prito two pounds or two euros keep it up Ben thank you very much cheers appreciate that and then I this is kind of what I wanted to show you was the, the the images of the drill cores because I think the images I have kind of show you a little bit more about their nature and we'll get into some of that in, in detail but you, as you take a real close look at these. It's something you can feel and it's something you can definitely see are the striations, these markings that are left by these tubular drills that have gone into granite. And there's been some interesting work that's done on this and analysis of this that we'll talk about when we get to one of these later on. And yet something else that I want you to see when you look at these is that you can see the, the thickness of the, um, right up here, yeah, here, this, 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 this channel. You can you get an indication for just how thin the material is that was used to drill into granite. And remember, granite's extremely hard stone. It's a seven on the most scale. You have grano, grano diorite that, that are slightly harder than that. Um, and there's been lots of conjecture, lots of theories, lots of um, lots of talk done about these, even from the time of Petrie. In fact, Flinders Petrie, who was one of the first guys that found the cores from these sites, and there's some of these cores have been looked at, uh, is is <laughs> There's lots to talk about. Let me keep this rolling and I'll look at some questions. So as we come in, you can now see a lot more of the granite. Okay, so this is, uh, I've just cut this with a little bit of footage from my earlier visit. So there's, the audio is a lot louder and, and obviously it's not stabilized camera, but. This has been quarried here. You can quarry see this marks. quarry marks. Here's something quite interesting. Hey, Paul. Why 
Why do mainstream see you know, just try it? Yeah. I'll tell you the drill that. marks. The drill. I've got some pictures, but you can see it's almost angled. <laughs> Lots of smoothed. Okay. Couple couple questions there. Uh, the drill, I say, makes me wonder if the, some of the drill marks are more modern, done by people trying to reclaim and move the stone for new buildings. They're not quarry marks, and they're not really modern marks. Because I actually have done a comparison uh, to modern drilling marks, and you can do this into granite and go and look at the tools and techniques of what it looks like when you use power tools. Now today we drill, we would drill thinner, smaller holes than that. We'd do it with a solid bit. We wouldn't use a tube drill to drill out like a, a core like that. You'd, you only really need to drill enough in there such that you can then crack the stone. That's how you quarry it. And you'll see marks here where they've been basically used. We've used hammers and chisels to, to put these little, these little like rectangular indentations into the stone. You put wood in there, you wet it, and the wood expands and eventually. And you do that in a line, it'll crack the granite. And you, the whole idea with quarrying is to try and snap off relatively flat surfaces that then you don't have to spend years and years trying to make absolutely flat. And when you're working from an original block, a square block that, that was done in ancient times somehow, you can then cut that into slices. And today we use big saws and huge processes to, to do that. It's in some of my other videos. So, and, and the markings as we'll get into them, they're actually not really explainable by any of our technology today. The feed rate, there's some interesting stuff with, I do want to get into as we, as we go on. I and mean, by the way, I do expect to go for an hour and a half. We go for as long as it takes um, uh, in this, uh, this, I don't seem, see the need to really rush through a lot of this stuff. We need a new Edgar Casey channel. Man, I could, I could talk for about an hour about Edgar Casey oh, <laughs> and his um, foundation oh, and what they've paid for over the years. But I mean, yeah, it is, if, so we saw a millstone there as well. That, that was a common quarrying use of, of, of the granite on these sites. You would take a big block and make it round, put a square hole in it, spin it in a bowl, and then use it for uh, milling up flour. Columns, it's spectacular when you come in here. The basalt floor, machined basalt floor, very flat basalt floor. <laughs> Oliver, thank you for the four bucks, man. Cheers. Frog pondering flip phones. Indeed, yes. I, it's, that's, I think that is a throwback to one of, I think I've said that, something like it. That's, that's what it's like, right? It's a frog trying to understand a cell phone. Like, it's shiny. Is there any black and white photos from the past of the jeweled granite? Yes, there are some. Uh, I don't have any access on hand, but there are from some of the early explorers that found these places. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. We, we, we kind of have Victorian era, Petri era, a couple hundred years back, pictures. Uh, and um, I mean, that's when they first discovered these drill holes. And that was unexplainable at the time. So this is interesting as well. I, I find you see this in a lot of places. The stars. So this was a ceiling piece that was probably obviously on the on the top, and it's fallen down. With all of these are all the columns. These the, and I, I've sort of skipped past right, the columns, but the columns are astonishing. Single piece granite columns, palm shaped. They're purely symmetrical. There was probably at least sixteen of them at this site. You can see the bases for them in the courtyard here. There's actually more columns around the corner. It's incredible to imagine how they were carved from a single piece of granite initially and symmetrical and then you redo it that those are typical quarrying marks right there on that block of granite and and the thing that uh is actually being pointed out here to note as we look that it, it's hard to tell what you're looking at specifically but there's actually a couple different types of stone in here this block here is limestone this block here is granite you have around this courtyard you have limestone encased in granite now where have we seen that before Right, there's there's limestone limestone encased in granite in the Sphinx Temple. There is limestone encased in granite in pyramid structures. Uh, it's a real interesting thing. And then you know, I, I this is where my mind sort of tends to take off when you, you get into things like the the high voltage electromagnetic induction testing through these types of stone. Limestone seems to have a, a stronger effect. Granite acts like an insulator, which doesn't make sense to me just given the piezoelectric 
capabilities of it but again you know maybe it needs to be under pressure for that I, again that functional nature this I, i'm pretty sure this was done for reasons other than purely ceremonial why would you go to the trouble to to make that wall so thick and encase limestone and granite i mean just make your wall out of granite if you can work in that material so again same thing on the other side here you'll see mm -hmm. granite and then limestone these were all encased walls that may have gone to the ceiling who knows and it's all since tumbled down and been quarried and taken away. Jeff Deal on dollar. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers. Baxter Riddleberger. Five bucks. Thanks from North Carolina, USA. Hey, Baxter. Cheers. Thanks. Appreciate it. Cold Coast. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. Everybody, good morning, good evening. I imagine. I, I don't know if this is a good time for people to. To uh, to do this, but this was I thought maybe two o'clock for me might not be a bad uh, a bad spot. Hi Ben, are there drill holes in situation anywhere? I mean, not lying down in a broken piece. So here's some 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 hole uh, pieces like this 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 piece that is around the back here has uh, a couple of full drill holes. And again, you you can't really see it in this footage. I've got some images though. Um, there's Luke molesting the stone, which is just what you have to do at times. It's, uh, you can feel those striations. It's really actually quite smooth and symmetrical too. So it's clearly done with some form of, of, of tube drill. And there's an absolutely excellent example later on that uh, we will get to. And that's when I'll divert slightly and we'll, we'll take a look at some more information on the tube drills. Some more columns. Again, this is kind of around the corner from the courtyard and that first um, pyramid causeway. Just, and it, it must have been some tremendous structure here. So this is... So smooth, you can see the marks, the drill marks. Clearly, this is clearly done by hand. Yeah, <laughs> perfectly so round. Right. Yeah, like clearly a just penetration marks on the drill bit. Yeah, which is you know easy on diorite and granite. Yeah, you know, it'll take a couple minutes. With <laughs> and you can see there's also it's also recessed into a, some sort of other. Yeah. This is an interesting scoop one too, right here. This is interesting. Yeah. You've got a, an interesting angle on the back part there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what what kind of tool action this? that is, but might I'll could pause be this, this, this video starts. We'll look at some images. Okay, couple questions. So, so let me let me just catch up real quick. I will hit a bit of music while we look at some pictures. Please promise me there isn't a polystyrene factory nearby. <laughs> They're not out to get me. Um, you missed this one. Hi, Marcel. How about this? This is a clamp supplies electric to sort of keep stones together. Yeah, well, the, the clamp marks are interesting in their own right. Um, this is true. So let me, let me, let's look at a couple of pictures here real quick. I believe, so there's some stars. I just want to get to these drill holes. Actually, before... <laughs> slight diversion from the drill holes. One thing that's interesting about to me is about the writing. Uh, and this is on the obelisk, and I think it, it, it was shown earlier. There might be another little picture of this obelisk that's up here. This um, this tells this this is it seems to me to be hand done. Like and this is the difference. Like some people look at the scratches in the boxes on the Serapium and say, well, okay, that doesn't match the technology level of the box. But then you have writings like this. You'd call them deep, well well executed writing, and indeed it is. It's very good. And this was an art form that developed over time in Egypt. They became quite capable of doing this type of thing over time. I'm not sure when this was put here, but I still I still believe that most of this writing came afterwards. And there's some little indicators of why that's the case. It's not really symmetrical. You can see the angles aren't quite precise. It's it it, it isn't a perfect circle like this. And this the green tinge is from copper. Originally, this would have been filled with metal, and it would have just it would have been amazing to look at. All the copper's been removed long ago. But again, this this circle's not exactly perfect. And and looking at their objects. They have perfect straight lines. The statues have perfectly carved uh, angles and corners on a lot of them. If they, they had the ability to make that perfect, and, and it's clearly not. To me, it's so it's one of the little indicators that suggests maybe this stuff was done at a different period than the actual object itself. But they got very good at it. Ah, question from BD. Hi there. Do you know of uh, for five five NZ? How are there? Do you know of any possible pyramids in New Zealand? I don't know. Love your work. Thank you. I don't know of any p potent, uh, possible pyramids, but there does seem to be some indication that there may be megalithic walls 
at a few locations. It's really, there's, there's some interesting videos if you go and look at them on, on, on YouTube. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at them. I've, I've watched a couple. I, I come down to like, we need more investigation. It'd be great to have somebody go out there and actually clear off and do some real looking at it because one thing I'll say is that there are natural structures and natural phenomena that can look a lot like megalithic walls. It's it's a deba it's an area that gets into a lot of debate. It's really hard to, to prove one way or the other. It, you, you have the same thing happen. Like I think Yonaguni is an example. Like Graham Hancock maintains that it's man-made, and certainly the images that he shows of that underground air, underwater area off, off off the south coast of Japan looks very megalithic. But there's other people and geologists who say that's just the type of rock. That's what it looks like. You have a similar thing in New Zealand. That's at least where it seems to be um, for me. The courtyard, one of these pillar tops. Again, these are just beautifully carved, symmetric, palm-shaped pillars. And the full width of that would have been the full width of the original block that the whole thing was made. Of course, pillars are, are an astonishing thing just because, you know, later periods, Greek-Roman periods, they... They built them out of rounds. They didn't make single piece pillars. Uh, nobody quite ever did this as well as the Egyptian civilization. Some more star blocks, some more star blocks as me in the courtyard back in the day. And again, some more of these uh, tube drills. You see these striation marks. And again, keep, just keep this in mind because we're gonna get into the details of why these striation marks are so important and why they're such a good indicator of, of some form of ancient high technology that must have been going on. It's, it's, it's essentially proof for it. And there's one more example after this that we'll get to that I want to take a look at. And, and again, you can see here's a better look at the striations that are on the holes uh, in this one big block. I think this is granite diorite. And then this scoop mark, which, which we just looked at in the video. Real interesting scoop mark. This is very reminiscent of the stuff you see at Aswan Quarry. And I think there's some process of, of something that was scooping granite like ice cream almost. Uh, and there's, there's some very interesting elements of that as well. There's this talk of like almost like a burnt line across the ridges of where these scoop marks would intersect. But the idea that this was all pounded out with pounding stones, it seems very implausible uh, to me. Let me catch up here real quick. Shermanator. Hi Shermanator, good to see you. Five bucks, thanks mate. Take it easy. Shermanator has been a long-time supporter of uh, this channel and uh, Puka J. He was uh, on top of everything we were doing there. It was great. Zahi, <laughs> what is this? Hi, Zahi. Hello. Mr. Sim, Mr. Sin, do you plan on doing any work on Ancient Island? I would love to get there. I've never been there. Uh, there are so many places that have these types of things. I, I yes i mean if i can i absolutely it's I, i've got a lot of this type of material to get through uh the traditional stuff but i'm absolute next i'm planning probably next year to start traveling again and, and filming and doing more um investigations into into more places i've got a, a, a lot of stuff lined up and hopefully i'll be able to put together a couple of group trips if people are interested it seems like they are and i think that would be a lot of fun it's a great way to also have a group of people be able to do some special things like the special permission trips you know, getting into a few of these sites that do cost more money, it's hard to do on your own. Um, and, and putting a group together really lets you pick and choose a couple real, real cool things to, to go see. So that, that would be the idea. Pounding stones would just wear your hands out. I think they must have worn out lots of hands. It's a silly, you go to Aswan one day. It's so funny. You, they put you in, in a, they literally indoctrinate you for a, in a, to have a 25 minute video that's mandatory you got to sit in this theater watch this ridiculous thing where they show you these pounding stones and then you they they have a few of the stones outside and you, you can go and hammer away at the granite if you want to um yeah it's really funny okay well actually there was one other comment about geopolymers on that block that i could have made um which i will real quick and then I'll come back sorry that is that what I want to say is that this stuff is why this is the same thing you see in that in that block with um, with the drill holes. These these lines, this is, these are these are strata lines in the natural stone. This is this comes from different layers of the process of how granite is formed over millions of years. It's just you know different bits and pieces in that magma in the formation. Now, if you were making a slurry and you were basically some chemical recipe that we don't have today. That's the big thing with all of this. It's, I mean, 
making this type of stone, as far as we know, only happens through geological processes and long periods of time. But just assuming that it was geopolymer, this just wouldn't be a result. You, you wouldn't get these lines. That's, it's, it's, no. Oh. Matt, how you doing? Matt from Ancient Architects. Good to see you there. I think you wouldn't get these lines with geopolymer. It's just one of the questions. I'm not ruling out geopolymer. I think it's highly uh, possible that, that, that I, I'm looking into it in great length now for Tiwanaku and Puma Punku, but I've got, uh, I, I don't believe it explains everything that we see. So again, we're still in this first courtyard. But it's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remain open-minded to all the different options. So he has no toes. Can't believe I almost missed the pie map. I missed the lineage of... Oh, well. Fire, wooden sage. I've lived in Egypt for 10 years, learned how to speak Arabic fluently, and I've only ever been to the pyramids of Giza once as a child. Now I'm dying to go back. Yeah, I can imagine. It's I, I, it's easy to do when you live there. You just take things for granted. I did the same thing in Australia. I've, I've not been to half the places I would have liked to have been to. Yet another drill hole. Again, these things are really uh, all over the place. It's just, I, I describe Abu Sir as just being littered with signs of ancient high technology uh, from machine surfaces to drill holes. Wait till we get to the granite, um, the, 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 the circular source. So try and, you'll enjoy the circ. If you, if you think that the drill holes are cool, wait till you get to the, the circular saw markings are just astonishing. And I, I, I love these columns as well, which have been put together the baby's closed. It's closed. It was closed in Chicago. <laughs> if it is Zahi, I Zahi. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> Zahi, you closed it. You guys are quoting from um, the Graham Hancock debate. They were yelling at each other in a room when we were... Uh... <laughs> Oh, that's it's still. I still haven't got. I still haven't screwed up the guts to really talk. I'm not trying to be controversial, you know. I, I don't. I say enough about. I, I have to. Do, I literally write a lot more than what I say in the videos. You can see the. By the way, just you could see the the conduit uh, block there in the ground in the middle here again. This is subfloor. Remember, this ran under the soil, under the floor. But yeah, I, I'm much more critical in what I write. And then when I record it and I look at the video, I, I sort of dial back on the rhetoric a little bit because it's. It's easy to be super critical of those guys. I understand the motivation for a lot of people in terms of not losing their job, their career to, to sort of toe the line, but it's it's um, it's tough to see. And then you have central characters and players that are really pushing this other narrative and really, I think, suppress That's where the, the bad part is. It's really suppressing what could be a lot more open-minded pursuit of truth. And they're doing it for, I think, disingenuous reasons. And it's that's what's annoying. Like, I just wish if there was open mind, if we were just more open about the stuff we don't know and that we not we don't have a, a definitive answer for, I think that would be, we you'd almost, you'd almost encourage more tourism. You'd have more, it'd be better for Egypt. So this, this is now flipping to my perspective. And what I'm doing here is I'm following the conduit block. So this is the, this would again, would have been under that floor level built into the architecture these are those U-shaped conduit blocks, and whether it had may have had piping, may have had something in it. This is it's, it's, it's astonishing to the planning that has gone into this. So just as you as you follow this around, just uh, I'll catch up on a couple of comments here. Get that going. Entrance to the north side, the causeways on the east side. I don't have any good answers. Egypt is the Greek name for Kemet. It is indeed. Kemetology, ancient Kemet. Uh, Egypt is the Greek name for Kemet. That's why Yusuf's group is called... And look at this block, by the way. Beautiful granite machine block. Ancient subwoofer. Doing my best to keep up with chat. Sorry if I miss stuff. Just hit me up again when I if I do miss stuff and you really want me to answer, just tag me. I'm trying. Okay, so again, the base of this one pyramid, you can see the other couple of pyramids that are over there and then the mastaba kind of sits in between them. 
A strong leaf blower would be, yeah, just try to get some of the sand out of it. It's amazing how much it fills up. This is um, a consideration with the Sphinx as well, right? In fact, thanks Matt, by the way. My book turned up. This is, um, I'm very excited about this turned up. There are very, very few of these available. They're quite expensive. It's a pamphlet of um, recovered uh, information and, and stuff that was actually found in the British Museum from the original uh, Lord Salt, who was the consular, the British High Consul to Egypt, I think, until like 1825, and he um, sponsored Cavigula, like Lord Cavigula, I think that Matt mentions in his videos to do a lot of his excavation works. And this is a record of all, they, they thought it was lost, and it was a record of his, ex, the first modern times, if you like, the excavation of the Sphinx and all of those areas. So there's some real interesting stuff that isn't available anywhere else except in this book. Um, interesting records of ancient um, excavation of the Sphinx because, again, that, that whole pit that it's in fills up with sand. You, you have to actively keep the sand out of it. And if that pit fills up with sand, then how are the walls the result of wind erosion? Because they wouldn't have been exposed that long. This is the, the traditional view saying that, oh, that's all just wind and sand erosion. It's like, well, it fills up with sand. It's been filled up to the neck with sand all the time. We, we have to keep it empty. It's water erosion because the Sphinx has been there for much longer and then it was filled up with sand probably most of its time. Yeah, I th it's conduits. I think it had water. I think it, it definitely, the, the under. I'm not saying conduit for, for wiring, although who knows, but... I think water is a good, um, or water or liquid is definitely a purpose for these blocks under the floor level. And um, so something that we call out later on, but you can almost see where the floor level was here by the different level of machining on the block. And this becomes more obvious later on. And I actually think I have a little clip of, I think it's Yusuf uh, on an early visit talking about the layers of the floor here. Uh, okay, Sticky. Uh, Alright, second time. What do you think destroyed all of this? Cataclysm, war, something else? Yes, I think um, all of the above. I think uh, I think you have... Cataclysm is likely a, 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 a strong influence of what actually was part of the original devastation. You see this in, I think, South America as well, whatever happened. Whether it was the Younger Dryas or later Cataclysms, but no doubt earthquakes and natural disasters happen. It doesn't have to be a global thing. It can be a local effect. I mean, we've got... We do have evidence of earthquakes loosening stones and things falling down and over thousands of years you get multiple of those types of events yeah for sure wars i'm not sure how much of this was destroyed i think a lot of this though is probably quar i mean just just quarrying last couple thousand years of, of using the place as basically a, a, a stone quarry yeah i love this yeah sand does protect the stuff that's right it, without the sand we wouldn't Okay, I'll accept pipe. I agree. Yeah, the sand is, uh, it does, it does serve its, serve its purpose. Toilets. It, that's what they say it is. That's what the, the Egyptologists will tell you. It's a sewer system. Okay. These things. Now we'll get into this uh, drill holes for a minute. This is just, this thing around the corner, spectacular um, tube drill mark for a couple different reasons. And then we'll, we'll take a, a brief diversion into why I think, uh, the tube drill marks are such a clear indicator of what's of, of some weird stuff that was going on. All right, so let me bring up, take a couple of pictures. Yeah, we've seen these. These were the, actually we'll, we'll see these again later. Let me skip forward to these tube drills. This thing here, incredible tube drill mark. So the striation marks, but also here you get a very good indication for just how thin the material was on the tube drill. Now remember, this is supposedly copper. And you've seen like Mark Lehner has a video of them like running with a like a you know a bow with a string on a tube drill and a brick on top of it trying to slowly 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 at a million years you know to, to, to drill into the ground. You don't get these mark. You do def get some marks. You don't get marks like these from that. And you can't use that thin of a material. It's often you look at the stuff they're using. It's way thicker than this. So what this this is very thin. And what what's really astonishing is that. There's been some analysis done on these on these tube drills, specifically the cores. So as you drill in, the core snaps out. And sometimes, if it's you know if you just if it doesn't go all the way through, you they'll, they'll wedge something in there and snap the core out at the bottom, like you can see where this the core has been snapped out. Now Chris Dunn has looked into this, 
And Chris Dunn, highly recommend his website, gizapower.com. Highly recommend his books. Fantastic evidence, particularly if you're into technology, machining, that type of thing. But Chris Dunn made us, he got into a debate with a guy about it, and he's made a study of, uh, where is it? He made a study of these drill cores. So you can go and find a few of these drill cores. One of them is in, I think, the um, the Petrie Museum in London. This is where he got access to go and take one of these, these drill cores from one of these drill holes. And he did a bunch of an analysis. And again, as you know, he's, Chris Dunn has, is ultra qualified to do this stuff. He's a manufacturing engineer, designs parts and bits and pieces for the aerospace and space industry. So he knows all about precision. He is, he, 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 I, I absolutely love his views on the way that, and he, the way he explains how precision relates to function. He's done analysis on the boxes of the Serapium, on many of the other coffers. He, he, I haven't even touched on this in my videos, but he took, because the, I like precision in the boxes because you can grasp the nature of precision quite easily looking at a box. It's the angles are so sharp and the planes are very flat. There's a whole other aspect to precision when it comes to statues and the, the, the angles and the radius of, of curves that are used in manufacturing some of the giant big you know granite statues. And it, it's it sort of indicates that the same tool was used to shape so many parts of that, like it was some sort of giant 3D mill. Chris has done some amazing uh, analysis of that. It's all in his books. It's something I'll get to in my videos, but anyway, he, he's looking at these drill cores and he's got a depth gauge and he's looking at, so how, how much did this material, whatever this tool tip does, what, how much did it penetrate into the actual stone in terms of the ridge lines that it left? And then he's taken, he looks at it under a microscope and he takes a bit of, co of cotton and basically traces the line, right? So you can trace the line. What he found, he did it on number, uh, diff several different parts of the drill core, right? So up and down the drill core. So what he's found by doing an analysis of this is that there's two spiral grooves that are on the drill course. It's not just one tool, there's two, so at least two cutting surfaces. And uh, the, 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 the crazy thing is, is the material feed rate. It's the feed rate, it, it actually penetrates, where's where he talk about it here? Um, It's just, it's, it, it, it penetrates, the feed rate requires just tons and tons of pressure on top of um, the drill bit. It's, I'm trying to find specifically where, where he lists it. He does put it on his website here. But what you can tell by, by tracing those unbroken lines is how fast that drill per revolution penetrated into the stone. And we're talking about tons of pressure and doing it at a much, much, much faster rate than our drills go into granite today. Uh, where is it? That's not it. I think it is here. He does. Um, it's it's just an unknown. Yeah, Petrie got vindicated because Petrie said the same thing about these. When Petrie first looked at this, he did the similar analysis, and Petrie said like he doesn't never understood how how they could drill so fast into granite with their drill cores. And there's been some debunking of that done by a couple of people. Then he Chris has went back and and he went and basically debunked that argument against Petrie. So he's essentially vindicated. Petrie in Petrie saying that this is a completely unknown technology in terms of how fast we can drill um, drill into granite. So and and in fact, so a question here from Zachary and I'm sorry I'm not keeping up with chat right now. Uh, could high frequency sound have been used enough to vibrate the drill? And that's actually what uh, Chris Dunn suggests is that it was ultrasonic drilling. Like he he seems to think that ultrasonic. Um, vibration with this with this tooltip is what explains the feed rate and the and the way that the the granite kind of gets smashed and a little bit like just microscopically when you look at how this works and now we're just we're way 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 out the realms of anything handmade right so now we're talking about ultrasonic drills that are penetrating the granite at a rate that we can't do today with that must have taken tons of pressure in a material that's this thick like the the, the tooltip's so thin that you can see from the actual drill holes like Okay, explain that with hand tools. Like, go and sh show me that. That's what I need to see. I, I can. I know you can cut into granite eventually with sand and copper, and you know, spend a day. You'll get. You'll get this this far in, but doesn't explain the evidence for what we see on these sites. It's and nothing we do in our modern times does either, which is why I just you know I, I think this is clearly some unknowns here. And use on any ideas on using ley lines. To, I know people. 
BD for New Zealand, two bucks. Any ideas on using ley lines to find megalithic sites? I know people do look for them and, and, and I believe there's plenty of them sitting on those ley lines. Oh, I haven't looked into it very much. Grand, Bill Weirdo, Grand Canyon vids in the future, maybe. Yeah, I have, I do have, actually I put some pictures up on my gallery. So if you go to the website, there's a, I added a section called travels and I'm, I'll, I'll share more of stuff that isn't specifically history related in there, but my Grand Canyon pics are up there. Uncharted X, what do you think the purpose of the drill hole was? Great work, by the way. I don't know. Uh, the purpose, it's functional in some way. I, I imagine it's part of whatever was assembled there. It feels like that's something you you, you, you go into. I know certainly there are, um, these drill holes were used to actually just remove material in places and like just ma then make a square section there's a really cool box in the museum that has like little drill holes all through it and it was they were, they were trying to make a square thing eventually i imagine it's just an easy way to, to remove some of the material um but yeah it's, it's anyway th that's the drill holes and i think this place is is one of the best ones for drill holes anthony regrettably i've got to go cheers thanks for looking uh thanks for viewing and uh, this will be up on my website so come back and catch up later no problem dowling right What's to say that some of the drill holes aren't done by hoaxes in recent times? I, that's that's the point I'm trying to make, is we can't really make that mark either. We don't really make those marks either. And Petrie's the one who first reported on all these drill holes. And lots more of the drill cores are, are, are available from those times. So there's and, and there are examples of modern drill holes. We, we do have, there, there are, you can go to, um, this is kind of cool, you can go to Bastet, Temple of Bastet, and you see where they've got modern drill holes into granite and see what that looks like. It, it, they don't look like this. And in some cases, you have weathering on the bits of stone, so you can actually see where the stone has been exposed for a long time and the drill holes also weathered. Uh, there's a few of them that are quite like that. They just don't look... I think if you cut a fresh hole, it's going to look fresh for a, for a while. Uh, what's it going to take for mainstream academics to finally start acknowledging this? What... Can, what more can realistically be done? I, I think it's a slow... It's a, just a slow process. Enough people in their classrooms, um, you know, asking them about it. It has to get acknowledged. I know it's happening in some places. Some guys do acknowledge it, at least privately a lot of them do. But... So let me just pause the music because this is um, another interesting thing. I don't know if it's by design, but... Uh, it's a ringing stone. So there are stone, some stones that are very resonant when you hit them. They, I'll turn this up. I don't know if you can hear that. And there's actually drill, drill holes underneath this block as well. I don't know what's happened to it to be busted open like that. There's a, there's a number of stones that just ring like a bell when you hit them in a few different places. It's quite interesting. There's an obelisk at Karnak, like the tip of an obelisk, that's a huge, big thing. It's like square. The square of this obelisk is taller than me, and it's laid over. And Graham Hancock was telling me about it when we were there, and it was one of the first. I got tooted at with a, a dude with a whistle. He's like, if you hit that, it, it, it rings. It's like, okay, it's behind a rope, so jump over the rope, and boing, and just it's like ringing like a bell, and like beep 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 beep. beep. I did, yeah. Get out of this. Okay, ropes. I did. It's right behind. The blue rope of thou shalt not pass. Do not, do not pass. I'm not going to hurt the granite by slapping it. Yeah, I was banging oh. on it. So... <laughs> um, something interesting here. As I come around, there's a, there's a little story attached to this. Uh, so we were hanging out. The, the, one of the groundskeeper here, the guys that look after the site, they will, depending on the circumstance under which you visit the site, they're, they're quite hospitable and it's standard. They will give you some tea. <laughs> quite often they'll be make like sweet tea that they make in their huts and just, uh, I'd recommend to, to avoid it, politely decline if possible. I mean, I've drank it a few times. It's not a bad, doesn't taste bad. But I can tell you what, the next couple of days I was sick. Like I don't, there was, I think it was using local water and it's probably not boiled and my uh, digestive system probably isn't up to the, um, the their level. I mean, so, so there's a drill hole under here as well. Again, a uh, nice lift drill hole that's in this block in between. But as, as you can see, I think uh, we get kind of cornered here while we're playing around with this stone. 
and I think I was trying to get some recording equipment out to record this sound, and I didn't catch the sound at all because we got derailed entirely by what we were doing, but, um... Carlson and others say the Grand Canyon was primarily created during the Great Floods from meltdown at end of Ice Age. I don't know if Randall has that opinion on the on the on the Grand Canyon. Actually, I I know he talks about the Scablands. I'm not. I haven't. I'm I'm not sure. I I haven't seen. I've seen a little bit of him talking about the Grand Canyon. Here we go. Oh, my head is good. It's too yeah, sweet. Yeah, have some. Some sugar. Have some super sugary tea, my friend. And enjoy the next few days on the toilet. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be great. I can't wait. Pin to a bathroom. Thanks so much. Um, and you actually, so yeah, the next yeah. day was at my doom, and I was just pale, and I couldn't even. I just was not enjoying myself crawling through there. It's, I mean, it happens. Yeah. Sometimes, and Luke yeah, yeah. was smart enough to dodge yeah. it this time. Randall did not say that. Okay, Scablands. Is, yeah, Sca okay. It's. Just, I know Scablands is a different place and story. I just don't think he shares that opinion on the on the Grand Canyon. Last I heard him talk about it, he wasn't sure. He said it's. I think he thinks it's a mixture of erosion processes as well as the fallout from uh, cataclysmic floods. I just looking at the place when I was there, it looks to be a bit of both. I mean, there's such sheer angles that you've got to imagine some of it was carved as, as a result of just catastrophic floods. Very nice. But it's, I need to find some more out about it. Let me try with my hand. You can always create a frequency with that. That's going along. You can always imagine having a whole series of these in different ways. I mean, it's in a chamber. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Yes. Probably the same groundskeeper as from like two years earlier. Okay. So, uh, interesting piece of stone. And then again, we're walking over towards the mastaba here. Yeah, mint tea. It's it's sweet. It's full of sugar and it's minty tea. It's um. Thanks, Henrik. Cheers. Good night. Some more uh, more drill holes. Where are we here? Oh, we need to. I'm gonna skip this along a little bit. Being made by hand or anything, yeah. that it was really powerful. The pressure of it while it was spinning was yeah. so powerful to create this kind of pattern. Because each yeah, each each rotation is pushing in like that millimeter or whatever, right? Yes. And so you need a tremendous quite amount uniform. of pressure. It doesn't screw in. It's quite uniform. Right? Well, yeah, it's, it's that's the thing. Every every cut, that's a rotation of pushing yeah. in. If it was yeah. a lot slower process, you wouldn't have those marks. <laughs> yes, something's just you play the drums. Hit that hard. Just right through it. Yeah. 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 So this type of granite, yeah. as we call it granite you read now, is harder than the rose one actually. Is it diorite? Granite diorite. Granite diorite. Yes. So Stephen was correct. It's the first time I met you. The other day. Mm. And I said black granite because there is no black granite. <laughs> granite diorite. Granite. Uh, it's all right. He used to put no, the boxes in the Serapion mm. Bazal. Right. Yeah. And I told him it's there. granite. He said, no, it's definitely basalt. But then I showed him, so I said, like, yeah, I told okay, him. I, said, I, I agree, I'm, it's I'm granite. I'm like three weeks into this crash course in, in geology. geology. Yeah, I'm sure you know more than I do. This is like, um, you know, the, the cheese, when they test the cheese, they take a piece out. You know, the Swiss cheese. <laughs> right. Yeah, he just carves it out, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, put yeah. the well, Swiss cheese is a bacteria, it's, uh, but this is uh, mm. it's not bacteria. Yeah, you know I mean? <laughs> same hole. They get a sample of it. And yep. That was uh, off the end of the Graham Hancock trip. We took a couple of days off to go and hang out with Yusuf, and it was honestly way better than uh, than the guides we had on the rest of the rest of that trip. And I realised that man, there's, there's people that you can see Egypt with that are going to be give you a much better experience than than regular tour guides. And from that day forth, Yusuf was the man. There's people <laughs> playing the rocks wrong. Why don't they find the drill bits or the drills themselves used to drill the holes? Good question. It's certainly not explained by the tools we currently have in the archaeological record. It's hard to say. So let's go over towards the Mastaba and then we'll get into, into the granite uh, area. So this is walking past the Mastaba. This is the part of the video that I'd featured in the ABC video that I just put out. 
some of this back on. Ooh. Catching up on some chat. It's too sugary for me. That's <laughs> too sugary for me. Yeah. It was way too, it was super sweet. It's tough to deal with. Oh, that sun is hot. Hey Trond, how you doing? I'll keep it going for a while, and you can always catch that replay. How do the marks not indicate feed rate? They they do indicate feed rate. I think so. I, I'm not catching up. I'm not reading all the discussion here. Um, thoughts on this theory that stones were melted or grown? They were, they were done somehow. I, I I feel like they're machined. I mean, then we have quarries and. We know where a lot of the stone came from, and we do have some marks in places. I just think they found that work to be very much easier than we would find it. Are there any places that Yusuf has spoken about that he would absolutely love to see? Things that are behind closed doors, so to speak. Yeah, there's quite a number of them. Um, there's giant areas underneath the step pyramid. He does get to see some stuff new uh, for the first time on some trips when we go out. I know Yusuf's also been over to Peru and. I know he's really interested in seeing some of the other places around the world that uh, he hasn't got to, but he's, he's got to most of them. Um, so this is this is the Mastaba that was all underground at one point, and as with the last live stream, it, it really reminded me of my doom, and particularly the box room. But there's some interesting things in this Mastaba. There's uh, a lot of writings and inscription. It was definitely used as a funeral area for... Uh, Ptarshepsis. The schist disc has multiple cutting surfaces. It was a cutting bit, maybe. Water jet can cut stone. True. This is. I think there's there's all sorts of look to me. I don't have the answer. I I just think we should be investigating all the possibilities because I think it's probably within our capability to find the answer if we did the right level of experimentation and try to replicate it and applied our scientific method with the right the right sort of open open mind to all possible answers the problem is is that you we just we tend to we just write off the whole we rewrite off everything you know we, we don't um we don't consider the possibility because we allegedly know that it can't have been anything by technology it all has to be explained from within this small window of primitive tools and handmade tools and human human horsepower uh, it's doesn't really make any sense to me that way uh, if we were open-minded about it we'd probably figure it out i mean if we applied Again, it's like, let's have the universities build robots to actually explore all the places we can't get into, the unexplored areas of these sites that we know are there. Let's apply every technique that we have to really mapping everything out instead of, I mean, the challenge is, is whenever these groups, this, these ideas come up, the muon ray detectors, there was an excavation at Hawara, you always have to partner with the authorities in this region, and, and I think part of those deals is they get control over the release of all that information so if it ever comes out sometimes it takes 10 years and or if it does that if it does at all there was an entire excavation at hawara that has never seen the light of day there was a whole this it's a whole other rabbit hole of 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 discussion but it's we're just not doing it in an open-minded fashion in my in my uh humble opinion What about the possibility that the purpose of the holes was to obtain the cores? Uh, and who knows what happened to the cores? Not many seem to be have survived. Yeah, they uh, they go. I mean, anything that small is going to get picked up and taken away. I'm sure there's plenty of cores out there, but I imagine they're in private hands. Um, there are a few in museums, obviously, from, from Petrie. Like, he collected them. When he, we found them, he took them. Um, all those sort of little, bit, little bits of stone, they're gone. Everything that's left now is just the giant stuff. You, you, Occasionally you see small pieces and in fact somewhere in this video there's there's a small piece of a, of a block that has a uh, The side of a of a drill hole in it And I'd be amazed if it's still there today I think it, I think it just those things just disappear and make them into people's collections um, Where can I read the Sphinx revealed online? I wish I knew Then I might not have had to buy it uh, there isn't any place. That's this book you're talking about. The uh, this book here. Yeah, it's um, you can't, as far as I can tell. I mean, I'm going to use it in. I'll, I'll take pictures and I'm going to use it in my videos as much as I can. Uh, I still haven't gotten through it. I've still got the Bosnansky book back here as well. But it's a challenge. There's only some stuff that you can get. Only so much you can get online. A lot of this stuff exists in these books. But, um, you have to track down. There may be an access to some of them in libraries. I don't know. We might want to 
look and see if there's a copy available in the library. Thanks, Nunia. So this is that really awesome couple of boxes with the limestone box in a box, which you would have seen on the roll-in uh, video. This, I find this, to, this is just mind-blowing to me. Um, <laughs> the trash is also a little mind-blowing, but this becomes a... Uh, hey, Ian. Cheers, man. Take it easy. Yeah, rooms bigger than football fields. Opinion on the mud flood theory. I think there was definitely a big mud flood. I think that was pretty much what happened to the southwestern United States at the end of the Younger Dry. So I'm not sure on a specific mud flood uh, theory. I don't know. Um, I don't know uh, exactly what what that what you're referring to. I have to have to check it out. What ancient place on earth? haven't I visited yet and will I go to next in the future? There are tons of them. Uh, I've not been to Baalbek. I would just love to get to Baalbek. Malta, Hypogeum, um, stacks of places really. I, I've not actually been to Stonehenge. There's, there's UK, Ireland, this stuff's everywhere. I mean, Turkey. It'd be hard for me to pin down a specific thing I'm trying I do want to and hope to get to a lot of them so as you can see this is I love doing this sort of stuff when just looking at the quality of the stone after you clean it off a little bit incredible rose granite just beautiful color oh the recat are you talking about this, this yeah okay, I'm not gonna get involved in the all of that stuff I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure he's onto anything with that stuff. Um, so yeah, a couple chambers off the sides of these boxes as well. And again, this is all that megalithic original construction, as you can tell. Let me um, just quickly uh, look at a couple of the pictures of these boxes. Did I get the boxes? I did. Yeah. So again, perfect inner limestone layer. This is a couple of years before the footage. The box has clearly been smashed up. But the back box looks in great condition. Just open to the air. I don't know how long it's been open to the air. This, I like this. This always seems to be some giant piece of stone, in, in whether it's a pyramid or, or anything like that. It reminds me of the block that's in the red pyramid when you, like above the doorway, when you go into one of the chambers. There's just this huge piece. Uh, in the wall, which is just obviously way bigger than the other pieces, and I, I don't know if there's a reason, but the, the one giant piece of stone above a doorway seems to be pretty common. You see the size of it in Luke's head here. It's just, I mean, fun, fun piece of stone to move around, right? And then again, another uh, little different area on the box this time, but beautiful, beautiful rose granite. My most probable hypothesis as to how these ancient massive structures were built. It's hard. I, I really, I, just, I, I don't know. I, I, it's hard. It's so hard to say from within our perspective. I think that however they were built, they had the ability to work with natural materials that they found just so much easier than what we do. They had some way to handle the stuff, to shape it, to move it, that, that wasn't as challenging as it is for us. Um, any number of directions you can go from there. However, they just they could affect the molecular composition of the stone. They could change its weight. They could it was anti gravity. They had some other some method of moving stuff. They had they had they were stronger than we were. I don't know. It, you know, it, it's, I just feel like how they did stuff was um, was was they seem to have had a, a, just a, a capability to work in this material that is beyond us. Wow. Look at that, everyone's my first spam message. That'll make me put on uh, filters and all that stuff. What camera did you use? Nice stills and video. Uh, these these cameras were uh, DJI Osmos. 
there are different alternatives to that now out there, but um, when we were filming with this, this was on the Osmo. Um, I love the, the modern gimbal controlled stuff, it's really, really good. Uh, I also have camera, I mean, I have a, an A-series Sony that is just desperately in need of a new body. Half the functions on the camera body don't work anymore, but I've got some nice lenses. And uh, one of these days I'll save up enough to buy a new body because they're not uh, exactly cheap. Cheers. Big dummy. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. One of these days I'll have to get around to moderators and things if this... Um, People like these live streams. But yeah, so this room, again, this all would have had a roof. This is all in the mastaba. And these pillars have uh, carvings on them. This is how we know it was Ptah Shepsis's place. We don't really look at them too much. I've got some photos, but we were, uh, when we visit these sites a lot of the time, the, the particular Abu Sir, Abu Jarab, it's, we've done it in the afternoon around sunset time. So we don't have so much time to, to roll in and see everything. You gotta pick and choose what you are gonna spend all your time on, whether it's bush bashing at the end of the uh, at the end of the causeway, or if it's <laughs> checking out stuff like this, and particularly the stuff that we get to. When I say anti gravity, am I saying aliens? I didn't say aliens, or just technology for ha that lost or perhaps civilization that has taken to the stars and left Earth. I d I'm not making any. Um, correlation between the, the whole off-planet thing. I just think that uh, within, the hu within the human timeline, we've so probably risen and fallen, and we may well have developed technology that has gone in a different direction to ours in the past. That, to me, is the most likely explanation for it. Does that mean that we've come from somewhere else and we're the hybrids between us and other aliens? I don't know. I mean, I'll say something that I do enjoy Lloyd Pye, his work, the late and great Lloyd Pye, has an excellent lecture uh, on YouTube. I think it's called Everything You Everything You Think You Know Everything You Think You You Know Is Wrong. And Lloyd's since passed. Fantastic work that takes a look at the you know the connection between Australopithecus and potentially Bigfoot hominids, us, our 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 how we fit into the into the piece of the picture of evolution on the planet. It's, it's, a, it's a great lecture. Uh, I will say that I depart ways with him when he gets to all the Sitchin and Unaki stuff. I, I'm not, I'm not a um, big supporter of that, just from the debunking that's been happened on the translation of the Enuma Elish. There's a big story there about what Sitchin was doing. I mean, he was writing a book, and I don't need to go into it. But, but the, there is, I think, there's a lot of open questions in terms of whether we were. You know what, what our place is on this planet in the past. I think it's just something we can. We're definitely of this world, right? At least half of us. We have mitochondrial DNA. We're part of the tree of life that exists on this planet. Whether you know, there's some interesting other indicators that are suggestive of um, genetic manipulation, perhaps in the past. It is quite odd that we have all the diseases we do. That we aren't se don't seem to be as suited to this planet as other species. We get, you know we die of exposure in the sun. We eyes can't look at the sun directly it's all this sort of stuff it's interesting it's, a, it's an internet hole to go down sometime if you're interested lloyd pie everything you think you know is wrong highly recommend it um it's it's quite an entertaining lecture he's a great guy i, I wish he was still around doing his thing yeah i don't totally agree and i look that's the thing i can appreciate someone's work without agreeing with everything they say and 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 i would hope that's i i like to disagree i like people that disagree with, with my opinion it's how we learn um i'm absolutely open to to alternative perspectives and uh, you know i try to listen to what people have to say because you can take the, the nuggets from it that uh, that you find valuable without signing up to the entire theory that's at least that's the way i try to do it yeah i i uh Nunya, I do feel fortunate to have been able to visit all these places. I think that way, the way we excel in computer tech, they excel in stonework, refined to a fine degree. That's you know such an interesting point. Like I, my career was as a technologist, so I, I have a couple of patents, and I'm just deep into the. I was deep into the IT industry. And it, you see, and I, and I've, I'm one of the. This is why I do this a little bit, but I, I've used to talk and do presentations and talk about technology and that progress, and and I love thinking about it, and it's this whole concept of futurist and how technology evolves over time and how our perspective changes with it is just such a powerful uh, tool for thinking and, and for understanding, trying to put these things in perspective, places like this, because 
you know, we the times change so rapidly with this development of, of little bits of technology. It changes how we see everything. Um, and I, I just you got to I just really try to make sure I'm aware of that when I'm looking at this stuff because I don't think our frame of reference is the right one for really interpreting what's going on here. So again, this this is interesting. These these are basalt walls encasing limestone blocks. And you see that you saw the, the, the flaky basalt that was on the inside of the wall. You also see a number of what is clearly uh, a machined surface that, that has these circular saw cuts. And this is this is in this is the area of Abu Sir that has these incredible circular saw cuts that that we'll get into. And very very like, I mean, whatever tool was used here was was gigantic. And again, very thin. And you see the same thing here, another basalt courtyard, and I believe we're getting over to one of the blocks that really shows a circular saw cut, and we'll take a pause and look at that, and I will catch up on a little bit of chat while I can. Yeah, Earth's gravity was different when these structures were built, that's certainly Jesus Gamara's opinion. Uh, I'm not sure I see it that way, but who knows. Are you into philosophy? Any opinions on the malicious god from Descartes? Uh, I am. I have some. And they're probably worth talking about at <laughs> some point in the future. I probably need to refresh myself a little bit on that. Um, I played as a technologist. I guess that is why I try and give you information. Thank you, David. Yeah. We can create them today. No problem, actually. If we can't, we can do even better. Okay. We can. I mean, with enough time and effort and all the rest of it. Sure. We do have a tremendous capability today. That said, nobody's built a box like the boxes in the Serapium. We, Chris Dunn tried to get people to do it. They wouldn't do it. Could we do it? Probably. Who's going to cough up the money and the resources to, to develop all those tools to make it happen? Because the only way we do it today is by screwing together five big slabs. Trying to make it out of a single piece, make it just like those boxes in the Serapium. We haven't done it. Uh, I think we could, but it would be a hell of a lot of effort. Okay, so this is one of my favourite, favourite, favourite things at Abyssia. It's the top of a giant block of basalt, and it's been cut, it's been sawn. And you can see the curve if you look on that right-hand side. And we, we take a couple good looks at this. And I have pictures. But you can see the curve of the circular saw that was used to cut this. And again, you can also see the lip on the edge, which gives you an indication of how thin this material was. And if you look closely, you can see, and I've got pictures, you can see the striations on the block. So that's not a straight line, it's actually a curve. And this saw must have been eight, ten meters across. Like it, it's just, if you think it's a circular saw, it is uh, it is it is just astonishing. And there is just these again, these striation marks and, and sort of indicators of how this tool's been progressing into the top of the basalt. You see this at a couple different blocks, but this is the my favorite one because you can actually see where the saw stopped. And it was and it was retracted. Or they, maybe they snapped the snapped the block off. But it's um absolutely uh, incredible. Let me let me look at some pictures of that because it's um, a couple pictures here. So limestone floor tiles. This is again this is that row of of, of basalt, and you can see on the other side of the basalt is limestone. But these, these machined basalt surfaces, and they have the crumbly basalt, like it's it's had an effect on the on the on the other side of it. This is the basalt. This is the basalt block on top again. You can see a slight curve to the to the saw here, and actually this gives you a little bit of perspective on it. Same tool. It's the same area. Uh, basalt floor tiles in this case, and columns were clearly here as well. Another row of of what was basalt blocks with perhaps encasing limestone again. So here we go. Here's you can see the striations on the actual block relative to my hand. You can see the curve on the right hand side. Another angle looking straight at it. This, in this case, the, the curves, uh, the, uh, the lines are running this way. You can sort of see them. And you can see how thin this tool was. Like, not very thick at all. I mean, that's a, that's a wobbly, that, you know, it gets more complicated too. There's, there's, there is, there's actually a, a block at, at Abu Jarab that has a similar characteristic. However, 
<laughs> it's as if it's also dipped in a third dimension. So it's it's almost as if the it's, the saw was following a path like this. Uh, it's it's so it's it's a circular saw like that cut. Just a bit imagine instead of it being a flat surface, it has a consistent dip in it like this. It's it's it's, it's or a curve to it like a third degree, a third dimension curve, and it's um. It's it's a real baffling piece of stonework. It's something that I think Chris Dunn talks about. I know uh, really Carmen Bolter in her series, the TV series, takes a close look at that block. Uh, I know Luke looks at it on his uh, Enigmas of the Ancient World channel. He's been out there and taken some footage of it. Zachary Larrabee, here's the resources. Really wish I could hang around. Much appreciation, love from Cali. Support these guys. Thank you, Zachary. Cheers. Five bucks. Yeah, and thank you for people sticking with me. I know this is probably running pretty long. Just look at that. That's not a natural um, surface. Me, uh, and I will we'll get through all of this stuff, but uh, I'm not sure how long I should be aiming to do these live streams for. Some people do live streams for hours and hours. I'm, I'm just trying to get through all of this, and I've got a couple other things I want to maybe get to at the end here. But the curve saw is crazy, and, and it's something I'll talk about. I've got images and some video of that, of that box. And that would have been under under the pool. Under, under the, the, yeah, under the yes. seven of basalt stone. Yeah. This oh, that's this channel was running. So but I also want you to feel the surface of the basalt stone. And I, I don't know if you all heard this, but when I when you see part of it that it's smooth like until here, and then the rest is rough like this one, that's because until here there was the floor. And also it means that they brought the stone like this rough and then they had the tools to finish it shape it and finish it yeah. on the side. Wow. Yeah. I mean this is just ridiculous. Under the floor. He made a very strange note. You guys can hear that. He said one of the things I didn't like about the Egyptians that they don't go out right. they do it inside the house. Right. And for him it means that they make the birds inside the house. Right. They used to go to the wine. Okay. But inside the house means what the birds inside. But he didn't imagine or understand that the Egyptian had sewer systems from that time. So for him it was a bad thing. But for us we understand that the Egyptians were very civilized. Because some stupid they say the Egypt. Okay, so there are a couple little things there. That I hope you could hear that. Uh, who's the guy explaining the floor and finish? This That was Yusuf. Uh, that was from the first time we were there. I think it was 2013, or I think. 2014. Um, couple things that he was talking about that there's the level of the floor uh, that you can see that it wasn't as finished and polished underneath where the floor was and the observation is that obviously they were, they were finishing the stone probably on site. Like they had the ability to finish that stone to a high degree on site. The other comment that, that Muhammad was making was about Herodot uh, Herodotus who said that he thought the Egyptians were dirty because they were going poopy inside the house and and that wasn't clean, but this is before the era of sort of modern plumbing. And uh, I think uh, Muhammad's saying that, well, actually, they were probably using it for modern plumbing, which is what the ancient Egyptians were using. Which is somewhat interesting because this is where part of these, these channel blocks come out at. It's, it's, I'm not sure it was a sewer system because this is what a lot of them come down to. There's a couple of these bowls, things like this, which are very strange because there's no way to then still evacuate and, and remove whatever's coming out of there, right? You, 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 you just have this bowl here. Um, I mean, not saying you couldn't eventually repurpose this place in that way, but I think its original functional purpose was probably not as a sewer system. Uh, it just doesn't seem to make sense that this is, would be the end result of a sewer system, and I think that's the comment that Yusuf's about to make here. So the whole system existed also in this structure, and we can see in this basin that there is no way to let the water go, which means that the label sewer, which is to get rid of the liquid, cannot be accurate. Because here we see through this basin that they were not getting, they are not getting rid of the liquid; they are containing it. And if it's water, or else. Now this straw, because one of the fellow guards here used this basin to feed his donkey. Yeah, yeah. They fill it up and then yeah. <laughs> fill it up with the straw. Feed his donkey. 
donkey. It's uh, now been used as a, uh, a a donkey feeding area. So. All Metal Mike, five bucks. Love your channel. The five videos on Serapine were awesome. Keep it going. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Yeah, I uh, I like that series too. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to try and put that out as a single piece uh, video. At some point, I'll edit it up together and change a couple things. Do a little redux on some of it. Um, isn't there the biggest blocks that you're actually walking on on the ground? Yeah, there's some of the blocks in the ground are absolutely gigantic. Okay. So yeah, and here's another look at this bowl. A couple of years later. Let's... I think we go back up here. This is kind of the end of the site, heading back up towards the... Um, the pyramids and into the courtyard. And then we we'll might skip forward to something else. Did the ancient Egyptians use outhouses? Yes, well, that's a question we're all dying to find out. I'm not sure. <laughs> what was it? Yeah, Frosty, I know that uh, you can wear down material with softer material. I mean, that is the theory on how they cut this stuff. And, and it is, in fact, how some of it was probably down. done with um, with the copper yeah, and the sand and the that. It's just, you don't see the same tool marks when it comes to... That's why I, I try yeah, to distinguish so between like Egypt, like, like specific machining marks that show evidence of high technology, the tubular drills, the circular saws. There's some other some marks on the boxes in the Serapium. You only see these marks on objects like slabs, like yeah. statues, like boxes. You don't see them on the later bits and pieces. Yeah. And you see a lot of, and this, my point about technology, and like, you're getting to a very, and then the precision's the other aspect. You can't get to a precision finish that has been measured to say, for example, 1 the width of human hair, like like they find on the, the Serapium boxes. You simply can't get to that level of precision by that hand tool slow abrasive method you just won't get there so you can't just you can't eyeball that level of precision um, that's why I think there's a that you got to, you're looking at a mix of technologies there's undoubtedly there were was a lot of relatively primitive work that's done on these sites but that was done after the precision work because the precision works in the lowest layers it's in the oldest sites it's in the oldest parts and that was I, I, I just don't think any of that's explainable by hand or by rubbing or, or any of that sort of thing that's where i think the mystery lies here is that these places were inherited and the later cultures the cultures we know about in our history everything that happened in the last six thousand years yeah they were they were relatively primitive compared to us and they were certainly relatively primitive compared to whoever built the megalithic stuff that they that they inherited and they built on top of yeah uh frosting yeah Huge circular saw mark can't really explain any other way than well a big circular saw. Yeah, that, right. I, I I don't. I mean, it's just it's just. I don't say I have the answer. I just tell. I'm just. I just don't believe the explanation we have right now, which is suggestive of, of the mystery, which is why I'm trying to expose it and talk about it. I guess. Um, so there's one other thing here. We, we we I think we've seen most of this. I know Luke and I went back and re sort of examined. Uh, these blocks, and I think we took another look at some more machine surfaces. Flaky basalt. Yeah, let's take another quick look at this uh, circular saw mark, just because we're here, and I, I quite enjoy this. Let's look at it. Uh, play. All right. Same block, and this is at a lot of. Uh, you, you can see these circular saw marks on a bunch of the blocks, but uh, again, this one's the one with the. Um, with the uh, beautiful lip on it, on the edge. Do you know that the pyramid is the most perfectly oriented building south to north, even more precise than the mm. Greenwich Observatory? Yes, I do. It's not the most anymore. I believe we've done a little bit of a better job now with a couple things, but it's absolutely astonishing that we that this was done so accurately in modern times. I mean, like I said, there's the White House, a few other things that we tried to do it with and can, couldn't come remotely close to the level of precision that's in the pyramid. I mean, that's the thing about the pyramid. We just, every aspect of it is indicative of some form of advanced high technology. Um, I know we were talking earlier about humans in space, like our, our original um, 
purpose and how we the planet and stuff. I, I think for sure we were mapping the world. I mean, it, I talked about it in other videos and in the other podcasts, but just the maps alone that come to us from ancient times, the projections, the accuracy of the maps, the undersea, the, the sort of undersurface look at Antarctica, things like that very indicative that we had a good grip on the planet and I mean the pyramid fits right into that given that it's essentially a scale model of the earth um, something I learned from Randall Carlson a long time ago that I always like to, to mention is that <clears throat> the pyramid sits on a, a sockle so there's a there's like a couple meters of padding I guess around the edge of where the, the actual pyramid sits on the ground and if you take the actual dimensions of that sockle the length of it and you do a ratio with the length of the actual pyramid it's exactly the latitude to longitude ratio of a planet. So because we're an obloid, obloid sphere, like we're a little compressed at the top, we're, we're a little bit further around the sides of the planet than we are top to bottom. That's why you have latitude and longitude numbers are, we're not, it's not it's perfectly square, it's just a slight rectangle. And that dimension, that dimensionality of the planet is perfectly encoded into the pyramid. It's, um, Where the hell did the big saws go? Nowhere they had them and they didn't make a single damn hieroglyph on them. I also doubt they were cut into smaller pieces. You know, I, again, it, whatever saw this was, I don't think this was done in the dynastic Egyptian times. I think that sort of stuff you see is, is something, a result of some process that happened long before that. And, I mean, now we're talking pre-cataclysm 15,000 years ago. I don't think there'd be much from metal left around anymore. This is why the stone is what lasts everything in metal. So you don't collect. And again, it, <coughs> it stuff gets taken away, right? Who leaves the jobs at the job site, um, ultimately? Okay, let me skip forward because there's a block uh, that I really wanted to show. Actually, this is the piece that I was talking about. Like, this is, I'd be surprised if these bits and pieces are even still here. So this is like a little limestone block that had a couple tube drills sort of cut into it. Um, you know, that sort of stuff is the sort of thing that just disappears. i, I got to imagine. If you can pick it up and remove it, then somebody's going to pick it up and remove it. Hey, look, I've got a piece of the pyramid. Look at me. Okay. Walk to crazy machined block is what this is called because this is a crazy machined block. And this is in the courtyard in front of one of the pyramids. And there's also some little machined hotepi things. Yes, and the official name for this block is the crazy machined block. And I believe it's made out of black sandstone, this thing here. It's it's a really interesting piece. I, I, yeah, I have no idea what it is. It's just a slab that is... Um, Pretty intense, really. Uh, particularly when you when you put some water on it to see it, and we get the right angle on it eventually. But it shows all sorts of signs of machining, and um, many many tool marks that are on it. I, I I mean, it's almost as if it was a practice piece for tools, or they were sharpening stuff on it. I, like, I don't even know. It's uh, it is an absolutely beautiful slab. It's all every, all the surfaces that feel very very flat, but you can also see where it's been it's been just worked on yeah. with any number of different. Um, tools so there's a circular saw mark on it the, the the edge of it here has almost been like just I don't know how you make those marks with anything other than some form of advanced tools it doesn't really ring like it's not that I, I, I have any idea what the um, the ringing stone really uh, really means Let's see here. Mining colony. All metal Mike. Could a massive object have approached Earth over time such that it reduced Earth's gravity, then knocked the Earth off its axis when it made its glancing blow? I mean, this sort of I understand the theory. I know there's a lot of um, a lot of different approaches and variations of that theme. Sure. Our cosmic environment could do all sorts of things. I mean I get the moon. The moon is, is extremely strange. The fact that the moon is as, as close as it is to us and it has the mass that it does. We've never ever seen a similar setup. We don't quite understand exactly how it was made. It seems like it's even older, if not a little, a little bit older than us. Uh, there's there's a lot of unexplained things. How did we get that wobble in our in our axis? 
there's definitely seems to be evidence that something passed through the solar system at some point because there are other planets that are tilted off axis and I mean you got to imagine in a, in a complete vacuum in a perfect space we wouldn't have these we'd all be in the same sort of um, plane of the ecliptic and everything would be balanced but it's it's not so something has happened who knows what I in anything's possible I what's your theory on why the site is so scattered could it have been flooding it's not that scattered. It looks scattered. It's it's pretty well aligned when you look at where the pyramids are. These are all little courtyards in front of the pyramids. I think they're all part of what was the original pyramid complex. Um, I mean, I think part of the reason why it's, it's so busted up now is yeah, you just it's just thousands and thousands of years of of wear and tear and use erosion, quarrying. I mean, these pyramids were once perfect. Now they're just they're slowly eroding. They look like step pyramids. You can see that the course, the masonry courses, step up underneath all the rubble. But whether they were actually, I think they were cased because there was there, there is um, a casing stone. There is granite casing stones in front of one of the pyramids, very similar to Menkaure pyramid. It's big, big old granite casing stones. And then you have obviously some underground construction that who knows what is going on down there. It just hasn't. I couldn't. I don't know. The last time that was ever cleared out, it's, you have the same thing at the at the actual pyramids as well. There's. Uh, I've got a picture of where the descending passageways go in, and they're just blocked up with sand and rubble. There has been some. There has been some um, excavation work done here recently. This is that's the front of the Mastaba. The uh, Czech Institute of Archaeology seems to have the connections to work on this site. They do a lot of work. There's, there's a good example, I think that right there, Frosty's example of like rubbing on stone over time, that looks like a door has just slowly eroded that stone, I don't know. Cool. Well that is, um, that's the end of the raw footage of uh, Abu Sir. I will, I do have something cool here though, that is a jeep ride that we took over to Abu Jarab at the back of this. Uh, let me... Um, let me bring up some pictures real quick. I want to show a couple things just before we move on. Do I want to show a couple things here? No, I don't. I don't. I, I do want to do... I will finish with that... With that... Uh, with that Jeep ride. Over to Abyssia, just through the deserts. Uh, just a question. Michael, Maximilian. Thoughts on the pyramid structures and faces found on Mars? It's a Richard C. Hoagland question. Um... I uh, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? It's possible. I don't know. I, I I haven't looked into it too much, to be honest. I don't really have an opinion. Um, I'm not sure that us again, us trying to make faces from clouds or from structures. It's who knows. I mean, faces, structures, maybe faces is like I don't know. That's that seems like it's a awful long, um, awful long bet. Hey, another spam message. Maybe I'll just remove that, shall I? Report, remove, I'll just remove for now. So one other thing I just wanted to throw up here, with it, which is a little bit of news, is that uh, another new species of humans, Homo luzoniensis, has been identified in the Philippines. Uh, really nothing more to add than this, other than it seems like we are way more complex again. Our history is a lot more complex than, than uh, we had previously believed, and I believe that is the, that is the question down here. It's, um, you know, we've had... A pretty simple look at it in the past and you know 15 years ago researchers had a very simple simplistic narrative of human evolution in Asia uh, Homo erectus migrated there from Africa and then settled there until they were replaced by Homo sapiens now the situation is totally different he says it's clearly a much much more complex picture of hominin evolution in Asia stuff's getting more complex right our past is way more interconnected and complicated than we would than we know uh, same thing here, another quick article, human settlements in Amazonia, much older than previously thought. I think we, we're now talking about, um, you know, Bolivia, like 10,000 years ago. So we used to think it was about 2,500 years ago we had people there. Now we have got carbon dating of proxies for human evidence going back to about 10,000 years ago, which is well and truly beyond where we previously thought with all of this stuff. Uh, pretty pretty um, pretty interesting I just it's just again put it in that bucket of stuff is way more complex uh, and older than we had previously thought one other thing one last uh, little news article I thought was really interesting which is 
Scientists attempting to open a portal to a parallel universe. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw this article. It's pretty interesting. Um, it has to do with sort of neutron decay and then and neutrons giving off electrons. They're basically trying to look at are, part, are neutrons actually traveling through a, what is essentially considered a, a mirror world or another, another dimension um, before returning to our dimension and it's possible that they're doing that and they're setting up an experiment to try and figure it out so it's a little wacky but the further you go into science it, it's string theory this multi-dimensionality and all this stuff it's the world's an interesting place and i just i just use this as an example of how our thinking will change and evolve over time as we sort of discover more about the reality of the universe it's just it's a it's a long stretch to sort of apply this to anything that we look at in the past but I look at it from a, the, the, the point of perspective, right? It's, it's like this is this is something that we're looking to in the future, but this may just become rote knowledge in a hundred years, right? We, oh yeah, of course, there's in the other three dimensions, right? And you can step over to them. There's, they've got a portal over there in London or whatever. I mean, this Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is at Oak Ridge. Those guys do some crazy stuff in those areas. Please don't blow the world up. That'd be nice. No, no black holes on Earth would be good, but. It's just an example of, again, the, our, 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 how we think and how we're mired in the, the now of, uh, of, our, of, of technology. Right? One last little recommendation that I want to share with everybody. And then I'll put this video on and I'll just go to chat and we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. But Robert Boval has a YouTube channel. Now you guys might know who Robert Boval is. He's written a bunch of great books. He did the Orion Correlation. He is the guy that makes Zahiwas extremely angsty a lot of the time. He's only got 934 subscribers on his channel. Has some really interesting videos. I, I, I'm a fan of Robert Boval. He's, he's good friends with Graham Hancock. He's written books with him. But there's some really awesome videos from back in the day over here uh, on his channel. A couple also some stuff about Zahi that's interesting. But for example... I sat here and watched this and was gobsmacked by it uh, the other day. He has the footage of the Great Pyramid climb that he did with Graham Hancock. This is this is Boval, Hancock, and Graham's wife Santa climbing the Great Pyramid, and um, I'm just astonished that he's on YouTube and he has very few subscribers. This has had a whole 934 views. With all the guards coming and going, and the feeling of so, doing so, something illegal. So with, early uh, days hiding with behind Graham. the blocks. That they sort of like narrate their way up and they, they, they you know, that's ah, awesome. Like, I couldn't imagine. I'm so jealous that they got to do this. You know, like this is just, it's an incredible, and you just sort of get to the heights of this thing and you just start to realize like, man, what a haul to get, bringing blocks up here and the, the, the construction of trying to bring up all of these huge blocks up here and do this in 20 years or whatever and make this. It's just, um... <laughs> I mean, Santa's such a trooper. I, I, I know Santa reasonably well. We, on the rock. She's just done everything with Graham. Like all the diving at uh, Yonaguni, she's just signed up and does all of it. And so I, I mean, that's not an easy place to dive. I've done a lot of diving, 300 odd dives, and yeah. places with like that, that are deep and they have strong currents. It's a, it's hard work. And anyway, just a recommendation away, if, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you you yeah. want to go and sign up to somebody. Okay. Go and uh, sign up for Robert Val and tell him who sent you because I would love, I've not met him, I would love to talk to him. I would love to get him on the channel at some point. I mean, he's, I don't know if he's doing too much of those sort of things these days. I enjoy uh, the interviews that he does do. He's, um, and I enjoy his work. I've read a, a couple of his books. So, anyway, I am going to pick that. And I'm going to leave this video on and I will just dive right into chat here and we'll wrap this up in a minute but just a bit of background on, on what this is this was uh, just a great experience so we were we were heading between Abu Sir and Abu Dhrab and you know friends of a friends of a cousins of an uncle and these sort of guys uh, somebody had a Jeep out there and we, we connected and he said I'll drive you over there I'm like cool and, I mean I, I, I like doing off-road stuff as best I can but I mean, this is pretty surreal getting in a Jeep and managing to drive between pyramid sites. And you can actually, you can see Giza uh, in the distance as well. That was Abu Sir behind us. And there's, you can kind of see in the corner there, there's the Giza pyramids. Um, yeah, you just roll and you can, as you can see from the tracks, it's, it's, it's a way that people do get around between these sites, but pretty cool. Like that was, this was, this was a cool experience. Um, limestone encased in granite. CERN is an attempt at portal. CERN might be. Let's see. 
One common theme on this planet is variety. That variety is a mechanism the universe uses to survive. Nature produces variations on a theme simultaneously so it can survive. This is, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's an amazing, it is an amazing place. I think that the world is endlessly fascinating. There's, there's lots to, um, there's lots to figure that. Frosty, my dad climbed the pyramids 50 years ago. Still says he remembers it very, very well. Yeah, I think we, we just, we've, I, we've just, you know, we've missed the chance. We've missed our chance to do that. Um, maybe in the future, I doubt it, but uh, it's, uh, I would love to do that at some point. Yeah, the mathematics of the pyramids are a lifelong challenge in itself. I 100% agree. I think we keep, we keep finding out things about that place. Firewood and Sage, is there any way to get in contact with Yusuf A1 for some trips? It would be so enriching. Yes, you can hire Yusuf. Uh, Kemet, the Kemet School of Ancient Mysticism. K-H-E-M-I-T School of Ancient Mysticism. I love this little shot, like following the birds as they pan across to Abu Dhrab. This is the Sun Temple of Nusara, I believe. And it's uh, was that's not a pyramid, that was an obelisk base. So it was a gigantic obelisk. And we will take a closer look at uh, Abu Dhrab in a future live stream but uh, you can he's available uh, you can contact them on the website get in touch with them Patricia his wife as well as the other members of the family help run that business so you can definitely hire Yusuf so I would um, you know I mean any trips that I put together I would use him anytime we go to Egypt you could just go on your own you can hire him for a couple days um, and they'll take you wherever you want to go uh, depending on where that is so All right, well, what's my timing on this? I can't even tell. Sure, I thought it might tell me somewhere how long I've been on, but in any case, I think I'm approaching a couple of hours, uh, not two hours, um, but an hour and a half, so I hope you all enjoyed that. So I thought it was, it's a good chance to sort of look at the topic and answer some questions, hopefully, about the, the topics of the videos that I go through. If you like it, I'll do more of these live streams, let me know. Uh, I've got plenty more raw footage that we can go through. There's so many sites that we can take a nice long look at like this. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I will be back this week. I'm going to try and get some more content out this week. Uh, I've got some interviews lined up. I've got Antonio Zamora. Uh, great, great. I've been wanting to talk to him for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm going to be speaking with him uh, about the Younger Dryas. I have a bunch of things lined up in that direction, but otherwise... I hope everyone has a good day, good evening, good morning, all the rest of it. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Not based in Australia. Nope, I'm in uh, Northern California. Alright guys, I'm going to roll this up. See you guys in the next one.